hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Stephanie Sorcek. I'm going to be moderating today's panel. Um, I'm a first-year master's candidate in public policy, as well as uh, Middle East North Africa studies. I'm also a member of the International Policy Students Association, one of today's sponsors. So it's my pleasure to welcome you here on their behalf, as well as um, the behalf of our co-sponsors, uh, the International Policy Center, the Center for Middle East North Africa Studies, and the University of Michigan debate team. Uh, today we're going to be discussing U.S. interests and policy toward the Middle East. Um, our speakers will discuss Iraq, energy in the global economy, and other timely topics from the region, including Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, some of you may have attended other recent events on campus covering these topics. Um, but of course, here at the Ford School, we are primarily interested in their policy implications, which is uh, what's going to differentiate our talk today from others. Um, we're very fortunate to have three distinguished speakers here with us, all current or former US government officials. Um, Dr. Colin Call is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East. Prior to joining the Department of Defense, he was a senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security, and he served as coordinator for the Obama campaign's Iraq Policy Expert Group. He's also a professor at Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. Coincidentally, he earned his BA in political science here at the University of Michigan before going on to earn his PhD at Columbia. Molly Williamson is a scholar at the Middle East Institute, a Washington, D.C.-based think tank. She's a retired career minister from the Foreign Service. Over the course of her diverse career, she served as Foreign Policy Advisor to the Secretary of Energy, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for the Middle East, Acting Assistant Secretary of State for the International Organizations Bureau, and Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia. And finally today, our discussant is Ambassador Melvin Levitsky, a, professional, a professor of international policy and practice at the Ford School. Uh, Ambassador Levitsky retired from the Foreign Service as career minister. Uh, during which time he's held several senior positions, including ambassador to Brazil, ambassador to Bulgaria, and assistant secretary of state for international narco narcotics matters. Uh, so to structure today's discussion, we'll begin with prepared remarks from Dr. Call, whose focus uh, will primarily be on Iraq. Uh, next, we'll hear from Ms. Williamson about energy, uh, the Middle East, and global um, economy. Each speaker will uh, talk for approximately 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, as the panel's discussant, Ambassador Levitsky will summarize their remarks and add a few of his own. And from there, we will open the floor to questions. Uh, so that's enough from me. Without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Call. Well, uh, thanks for uh, everybody for coming today. And thanks especially to the Ford School for uh, inviting me here. It's great to be back. Um, I uh, was born in Michigan. I, I went to undergraduate here. I spent some time uh, here uh, during uh, graduate school as well. I, even while I was getting my PhD at Harvard, I was actually, um, my particular connection, I have a, a strong connection to the University of Michigan debate team, uh, where I was a member of the debate team when I was here uh, as an undergrad, and then I came back and, and was an assistant coach for a couple years. So I'm kind of an all-purpose nerd. Uh, I've had many nerd roles. Uh, my most uh, recent uh, one being the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East. And just to give you a sense for what that means, um, I'm basically, I run the Middle East office, the Middle East Policy Office for the Secretary of Defense and the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. And the Pentagon uh, defines my portfolio as the 14 countries and territories that stretch from Egypt up through uh, Israel and the Palestinian territories, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, into Iraq, Iran, all the small GCC states, Saudi Arabia, and then down the Arabian Peninsula to Yemen. Uh, so I don't have Turkey, I don't have any of the rest of North Africa, I don't have any of the stands, you know, I just have the, the easy countries uh, in between. Um, I, uh, I spend the vast majority of my time on the three eyes, uh, Iran, Iraq, and Israel in some combination. I'm gonna talk about Iraq uh, today. Um, obviously, I imagine given all that's happened in recent weeks, uh, uh, with Egypt and the peace process and, and with, uh, you know, interest that people have on Iran, uh, uh, et cetera, that those might be topics of conversation. Uh, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to entertain them, although my remarks uh, or are, about, uh, are, are about Iraq. Um, I should say, though, that, you know, even though I'm talking about Iraq, Iraq is not hermetically sealed from the activities that are going on and the, the, the events that are unfolding in the rest of the region. Um, I was, in, I was in Iraq uh, for my 13th trip uh, in, my, in my position over the last two years, uh, about 10 days ago. Um, I met my, uh, my boss, the Undersecretary for Policy, on the tarmac of a US military base in Anbar province at al-Assad. My plane, I was coming in from, from another country in the region, and she landed, we landed about the same time. And this was just when the, um, 
when the protests in Egypt were getting their most chaotic, you remember the scenes of the camel guys on camels and horseback whipping people, and there were beatings and burning police trucks and, and everything else. And uh, I met her on the tar tarmac, and I said, welcome to Iraq, the most stable country in the Middle East. <laughs> and uh, it was interesting, because that evening, we, uh, we had a, a, a dinner um, at the, uh, the Chargé's house in the, in the green zone in, in, um, in Baghdad, and there were a bunch of Iraqi officials and senior advisors there. And all the talk was about Egypt, of course, um, but one of the things the Iraqis were particularly proud to point out was that they had just sent three planes, Iraqi planes, from Baghdad to Cairo to evacuate Iraqis back to Iraq because it was too unsafe in Egypt. <laughs> And to me, that's what victory looks like. <laughs> no, it's, 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 I think it's, it's, a, it's a sign of how, uh, how dramatically things can, uh, can change. Um, on September 1st of, of last year, um, of, of 2010, uh, President Obama uh, spoke, he actually spoke on August 31st, to announce um, the end of Operation Iraqi Freedom and the beginning of, of what we call Operation New Dawn. But it was really to signify the end of U.S. combat operations uh, in Iraq and the transition to a fundamentally uh, different mission. Uh, we currently have about 50,000 forces uh, in Iraq. Um, they are there in, in largely an advise and assist role. They're basically doing three things. Uh, they continue to partner with Iraqi security forces uh, in the conduct of, of counterterrorism operations, largely in an advise and assist role. Uh, more broadly, they are advising, assisting, and, and uh, helping train on equipment, um, the Iraqi security forces. And then they're also assisting uh, our State Department colleagues as well as international actors like the United Nations in their capacity building efforts uh, throughout the country. So the U.S. military calls these stability operations. So we basically made the transition from combat operations to uh, stability operations, and that's where we are now. Um, one of the major points I want to make is that even though we've dramatically drawn down our military presence in Iraq and we plan to complete that drawdown over the course of this year, um, that we don't envision the end of our large-scale military presence in Iraq as, as the same thing as disengagement from Iraq. This administration, even though President Obama was against the war, uh, even though uh, drawing our, getting our troops out of Iraq was a big part of the campaign, President Obama is committed to a long-term strategic partnership with Iraq. Uh, and we just want to change the ratio of, of our engagement with Iraq toward the civilian end of the equation away from the purely military uh, end of the equation. So one of the major things we've been emphasizing is that our drawdown from Iraq is not the same thing as disengagement. Um, so what I want to talk to you about over the next 10 minutes or so is give you a little sense of what things are like uh, in terms of the security environment, some of the stability challenges that we see uh, over the coming year and beyond, and then give you a little sense of how uh, our government is trying to position itself to be a long-term partner with Iraq. Um, I think if, if I, mean, I don't know how much you all think about Iraq these days. It's not in the news relative to you know, Egypt or Afghanistan or other events. But Iraq is clearly a country of central importance to the United States. I mean, the United States has either been at war with Iraq or inside Iraq for two decades. There was the Gulf War. There was 10 years of enforcing the sanctions, no-fly zones. And then, of course, uh, the, uh, the war since 2003. So obviously, we've invested an enormous amount in blood and treasure in Iraq. Iraq is a, remains a strategically vital country. And so I want to give you a, a little bit of a sense for where we see uh, the partnership uh, going. Um, so I started by talking about this pivot from combat and counterinsurgency operations towards these stability operations, uh, largely oriented around advising and assisting the Iraqi security forces. Largely, our ability to make this change of mission has been enabled by a dramatic change in the security environment in Iraq. Right? Iraq is still a very dangerous place, but it is much less dangerous uh, than it used to be. The, but the first time I, I traveled to uh, Iraq during the war was in the summer of 2006, in, ju in late July. At the time, uh, Iraq had tipped into communal civil war. Uh, you know, on an average Tuesday, uh, Sunni extremists were blowing up Shia marketplaces, killing uh, dozens of civilians, and then the following day, dozens of Sunni men would show up in landfills with bullet holes uh, in, their, in, their, in their heads. And you kind of had this tit-for-tat cycle of retributive sectarian uh, violence. And every day, we were finding 100 or 150 bodies on the street in Baghdad. It was a gruesome, gruesome time. And there wasn't a lot of hope for things being turned around. This slide, do you all remember back from um, General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker gave famous testimony in the fall of 2007. Uh, and, it, and the goal of that testimony was to evaluate the progress of the surge, which as you can recall was an extraordinarily controversial and politically charged uh, decision. This is the first time this chart appeared. All right. 
But does anybody remember when it was? <laughs> All right. Here. All right. The peak is reflective of the attacks during the height of the violence uh, in, in Iraq. When General Petraeus gave testimony, we were, we were first starting to see things turn around for a whole confluence of factors that we can talk about if you're interested in the, in the, in the Q&A. Sometimes they're chalked up to the surge, what the surge actually meant and what the relative importance of the adding the additional forces versus change in strategy versus changing calculations of the combatants on the ground versus changing decisions by regional players like Iran. Historians will be debating for decades what caused the violence to come down, but what, what is unmistakable is the degree to which the violence in Iraq has come down. Right? So what you see is where we are now in January of 2011 that for the two years of the Obama administration, violence levels as tracked by levels of attacks have basically been flat at their lowest level since the beginning of the war. Again, Iraq remains a very dangerous place, but compared to what things were like in the dark days of 2006 and 2007, uh, it's pretty remarkable turnaround in the security situation. What I think is even more remarkable and less recognized is that it's not like things have stood still during this period. Right? Over the course of this period, we have drawn down nearly 100,000 U.S. forces. We have handed over security responsibility for the entire country to include major cities like Mosul and Baghdad and, and elsewhere to the Iraqi security forces. The Iraqis have had two elections, two national elections, provincial elections and, an, and a uh, national elections for their parliament. And they had nine months of contentious government formation. Right? The last time Iraq had six months of government formation was in 2000, early 2006 and the country tipped into civil war. This time we had nine months right in the middle of the biggest drawdown of U.S. forces and the wheels didn't come off. Right? To me, that's an indication that things have changed that there, there are kind of shock absorbers in the system in Iraq that didn't exist a couple of years ago. A big part, of, and so let me point to a couple of those. The folks who have, the, the, the violent extremist groups who, uh, you know, had been committing acts of terrorism, uh, engaged in insurgent violence, and gained, engaged in death squad activity, we judged to be much weaker than they were before. Al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, for example, uh, which is a largely homegrown institution that has some connection to Al-Qaeda Central, but is largely made up of, of, of Iraqis and has connections to other Sunni insurgent groups is much weaker than they used to be. Our assessment is that they no longer really represent an insurgency per se in the sense of being able to hold large swaths of territory. Um, they are capable of engaging in periodic spectacular acts of terrorism and they will likely remain capable. But we do not currently assess Al-Qaeda in Iraq to represent a strategic threat to the viability of the Iraqi state. Right? Similarly, on the Shia militant side of the equation, you probably remember Muqtada al-Sadr's uh, Jaysh al-Mahdi, the Mahdi army, uh, JAM, the military used to call him, Jaysh al-Mahdi, JAM. The mil our military turns everything to an acronym, uh, and JAM's a good one. So uh, the, the Mahdi army militia was basically disbanded uh, in 2008, um, largely as a consequence of uh, getting their teeth kicked in a little bit by the Iraqi security forces uh, in 2008, uh, and then Muqtada al-Sadr's decision to reorient his movement towards social and political activism and away from militancy. He still maintains a very small uh, element of uh, militants called the Promise Day Brigades. Um, there are two other Shia militant groups, Asab al-Haq and Kateb Hezbollah, with varying degrees of ties to uh, the Shia community inside Iraq, but also ties to Iran, uh, which continue to engage in violence. But we don't judge that the Promise Day Brigade, Asab al-Haq and Kateb Hezbollah have a wide, uh, spec have wide spectrum support among the Iraqi population and uh, not unlike Sunni insurgents, uh, we don't judge them currently to, uh, uh, to represent a strategic threat um, to the government of Iraq. Um, a lot of the residual attacks, frankly, are against our forces um, and uh, we don't judge that they have a strong intent to try to overthrow uh, the government uh, in, uh, in Iraq and were they to try, uh, they're likely to be beaten back, largely because of a second major factor that's enabled our drawdown in this change of mission and that is the growth of the Iraqi security forces. There are currently more than 660,000 Iraqi security forces. Um, one of the, you know, a lot of people talk about our surge in 2007, but the Iraqis also made their own surge. We've grown about, um, uh, the Iraqi security forces have grown by about 200,000 since uh, the surge. Uh, more importantly, their professionalism and their capabilities have increased uh, dramatically. Frankly, in 2005 and 2006, during the, the height of this uh, sectarian violence, 2005 is when it started, 2006 is when it escalated, 2007 is when, early 2007 is when it's reached its height, there were elements of the security services, especially on the police side, that were actually part of the problem. Um, 
we've seen a dramatic change in the professionalism of the Iraqi security forces, and, and not surprisingly, opinion polls in Iraq show a fair degree of confidence in both the police and the army. Um, so one of the reasons why I think there's, there's one of the biggest shock absorbers as we've kind of worked ourselves out of a job in Iraq is the fact that there are numerous Iraqi security forces that have a fair degree of confidence among the Iraqi population, and they're simply, they simply overmatch what's left of the insurgency. Right? Foreign armies never really win insurgencies. What they do is they tee up the host nation governments to take it, to take it across the goal line, and I think that's where we're basically uh, at uh, as it relates to, uh, to Iraq. Last but not least is the fact that across the political spectrum, the folks who used to be killing each other have largely bought into the political process. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a neat process. Uh, democracy is messy all over the place. It's certainly messy in, in Iraq. There is a lot of heated rhetoric in Iraq. But as long as most of uh, the, uh, the uh, communal groups and politicians are, are duking it out with words instead of through the force of arms on the street, I think we'll be okay. Uh, and uh, so I think the, the buy-in into the political process uh, uh, is another reason why we should, set, should have some hope that the stability gains uh, can endure over time. All right, that's the glass half full piece of it. There are some, there are some uh, uh, elements that will need to be addressed in the coming months and years to really consolidate stability and to bring these numbers even further down. And most of these uh, uh, relate to the Iraqi political side of the equation. Let me highlight two. There are more than two, but let me just highlight two. Um, the Sunni Arab community in Iraq is much more bought into the political process than they used to be. A lot of the combatants that used to fight uh, U.S. forces and uh, fight the Iraqi security forces and commit attacks against the government of Iraq um, have defected, uh, have stood down, and many have joined the pol political process. That's the good news. There is still a challenge, however, in ensuring that there is adequate Sunni integration into Iraq's political institutions. Uh, one of the things we're particularly focused on is the need to complete the integration of the so-called Sons of Iraq. These were basically the local neighborhood watch uh, organizations. Uh, they used to be called Concerned Local Citizens, and before that they were called the Insurgency. Uh, uh, and uh, there were, at, the, at its height, there were about 100,000 Sons of Iraq. About 50,000 of them have been integrated into some mix of security service jobs and civilian ministry jobs, but that still leaves about 50,000 uh, who man checkpoints and, uh, and such. And, and the integration of those folks over time is going to be important to kind of locking in uh, the gains and making sure that some of these guys don't go back to the insurgency. Um, the other major uh, fault line that, that we're going to have to wa watch uh, closely and offer help where we can is along the Arab Kurd uh, dimension. There's not been a lot of violence along the Arab Kurd dimension in Iraq, but there has been a lot of tension along that fault line centered around the bread and butter of politics, resources, territory, and security. Basically, as you know, the, the three uh, uh, you know, quasi-autonomous provinces that make up the Kurdistan regional government up north just south of, of those three provinces, however, are a whole host of disputed areas. That is, where the communities that live there uh, dispute whether they should technically be part of the KRG or that they should be part of the rest of Iraq. And so we call these the DIBs, the, you know, it's another acronym, right? The disputed internal boundary area is the most prominent uh, one that I'm sure you all have heard of is the city of Kirkuk, the oil-rich city of Kirkuk. So trying to figure out the status of the disputed internal areas is, is, continues to be a challenge. The disposition of security services in those areas continues to be a challenge. There are Kurdish security forces, the Peshmerga. There are Kurdish intelligence and police forces that occupy land south of the KRG, right, which is a major irritant uh, to uh, Sunni Arab communities. There's also the disposition of oil revenue uh, and how much of it is distributed to the north. What are the rights of the Kurds to uh, allow companies to come in and, and sign contracts and things like that? So. You know, oil, soil, and security are all uh, issues along the Arab-Kurd uh, dimension that, um, you know, our current judgment is that neither side has an interest in a real knockdown, drag out, violent confrontation over these things. Our major concern, however, is that you could get a low-level incident that could inadvertently escalate into, uh, into an all-out confrontation between uh, Kurds and Arabs. It's for that reason that last year, um, U.S. forces in Iraq stood up what's known as the Combined Security Mechanism, which is basically a series of joint checkpoints, joint patrols, and joint coordination centers that dot the disputed internal boundary areas with the goal of limiting the prospect of a local level incident escalating out of control. Right? So one of the major challenges as we complete the drawdown 
uh, over the next year in accordance with the U.S.-Iraq Security Agreement is transitioning what is a, currently a trilateral mechanism for dispute resolution and confidence building into a bilateral uh, mechanism. So that'll be a major uh, challenge. One of the big things that occupies my job is, you know, I've talked a lot about transitioning responsibility from the United States to Iraq, and that's the major transition that's happening uh, as our troops complete their drawdown this year. But the other transition that's happening is, is, is transitioning responsibilities from the Department of Defense to the State Department, right? In the summer of 2009, we started an interagency process to identify major areas where the transition needed to happen uh, to be successful. We identified four. The first was, a DOD assessment of what the Iraqi security forces needed to attain what we call minimum essential capability for internal defense by the end of 2011, and then to make sure that we uh, ask Congress for enough money to help us achieve that objective. Right. The second was a plan to transition the police training mission, which is traditionally a State Department mission, but in Iraq since 2004 has been a Department of Defense mission, to transition that back to the State Department. Because the police lag behind the Iraqi army uh, in terms of their development capabilities and professionalism. So we need to continue to work that problem set over time. And frankly, what we're pushing towards and what the Iraqis want to push towards is what is sometimes called police primacy. That is, you don't want your army internally focused. You want it externally focused. Right? For, the, for the health of Iraqi democracy over the long term, you want the army to be a professional externally oriented force, not one that's involved constantly in internal security matters. You want the police to do that. Right? But the police aren't quite in that position. So the development of the police over time will not only increase their capabilities to provide security, but also allow the Iraqi army to basically redeploy uh, towards, uh, towards the, the borders. And I think that'll ultimately good, be good not only for stability, but, uh, but for the health of, of uh, Iraqi uh, democracy. The uh, third major transition area uh, has been, you know, much of our engagement throughout Iraq has been the fact that we've had in excess of 100,000 forces there all over the country involved in uh, engagements with local leaders, with local, local tribes, empowering civilians to get out, the provincial reconstruction teams and others. So what do you replace that presence with that would still allow the United States to engage in local dispute resolution, provide programs, et cetera? And so the State Department has identified, you know, obviously they'll have a very large embassy in Baghdad. They will then have a consulate in the north in Erbil, the capital of the KRG, and then a consulate in Basra, which is the biggest city uh, down south. Uh, uh, much of the country's oil flows through or is centered around uh, Basra. And then we'll have two embassy branch offices, one in Kirkuk and one in Mosul. Uh, and they're oriented on purpose to the north because of the Arab Kurd issues and because of some of the residual challenges with the insurgency uh, up north. The fourth, uh, the, the fourth effort uh, the fourth and final effort in this transition is to, is to stand up uh, the Office of Security Cooperation in Iraq. Um, the Bush administration in November of 2008 signed what, what we used to call the SOFA, in the Status of Forces Agreement, but we now call the Security Agreement, and the Iraqis call it the Withdrawal Agreement. All right? Whatever, whether you call it the SOFA, the Security Agreement, or the Withdrawal Agreement, it basically lays out the contours for the drawdown of U.S. forces, uh, and it requires remaining U.S. forces to leave by the end of this year. All right, that was negotiated by the previous administration. It was re-blessed by uh, the Obama administration, given further definition uh, when, the, when the president talked about how the drawdown would happen in, those, in the spaces in between. Um, but there's a, there was a second agreement that a lot of people don't talk about that was signed at the same time called the Strategic Framework Agreement, the SFA. And the SFA was a commitment between the United States government and the government of Iraq for long-term cooperation across a whole host of fields, political, economic, cultural, educational, scientific, uh, environmental, legal, and security. So as we transition our, the, the remainder of our uh, mainline forces out of Iraq, there will be an Office of Security Cooperation in the hundreds that is embedded within the U.S. Embassy that will continue to provide security assistance and be the mechanism for security cooperation, things like military exchanges, joint exercises, the things we do all over the rest of the world where we have similar offices of security cooperation, although they vary in size. So the Iraqis have an interest in us continuing to have involvement in the development of their security forces and in cooperating with us, and so do we. So the Office of Security Cooperation will be a mechanism uh, for that. Let me just conclude by uh, ma making a final pitch for why we, should, uh, why we should care. You know, the Secretary of Defense um, frequently makes reference to the last scene in Charlie Wilson's war, right? Where having, uh, having stood up the Mujahideen and, and driven the Soviets out of Afghanistan, we then walked away from Afghanistan, and we saw what happened as a consequence. And 
uh, the Secretary of Defense frequently says at, at this juncture, having invested almost a trillion dollars, having, you know, 4,500 uh, or so Americans having lost their lives, more than 30,000 wounded, given this enormous investment, this isn't the time to kind of be penny wise but pound foolish, that we have to kind of finish the job. And so I think we should care whether the job gets finished in Iraq. I mean, Iraq has been a major source of instability, either, either as an aggressor state or as an unstable state uh, that was worrisome to its neighbors for decades. And we now have an opportunity for Iraq to be re a reasonably stable, long-term partner of the United States, and I think we should seize uh, that opportunity. So with that, I will uh, conclude, and I look forward to Molly's comments and your questions. All right, well, thanks very much. Um, we're now going to turn things over to Molly Williamson. Thank you, Stephanie, and, and thank you to uh, Professor Levitsky and the center here at the University of Michigan. It's a real treat. It's an honor for me to be here, uh, and I'm, I've been looking forward to this for, for some time. Uh, my topic is dense, so I'm going to leap into it, um, but uh, there are two things that if I don't cover, I um, invite you to uh, remind me and, uh, and ask at, at Q&A time, one, where am I getting my, my statistics from, and I'll give you the websites, because I don't want you to get bogged down in the numbers. I want you to uh, play with the concepts. Uh, and uh, secondly, um, the potential game changer of non-conventional oil and gas. Uh, that can, uh, can change the, the profile of the United States uh, in the energy game. So if I don't get to those, make somebody remind me. Um, first, a word on the scope. Uh, every day, the planet consumes more than 86 million barrels of oil a day. That's more than we have ever as a planet consumed, despite the global recession of the last couple of years where we did have a downturn. Uh, and we did tighten our belts globally. Nonetheless, we have now uh, bounced back. Uh, a word on the order of magnitude. The United States is by far the single largest consumer at 19 plus million barrels a day, of which we must import more than 10 million barrels a day. Number two uh, in, in the uh, consuming ranks is China. Who, uh, which has to import seven plus million barrels a day. Japan third at four plus million barrels a day. The average American consumes more than twice that of the average Brit, more than six and a half times that of the average Brazilian, and more than 21 times than that of the average Indian. Projection, over the next 20 to 25 years, we as a planet, are expected to consume 53% more coal than we use today, 42% more natural gas than we use today, 22% more oil. And of all energy use, oil remains the single largest fuel in the primary fuel mix of the year 2030. We expect demand to grow, and we expect that that demand growth should be roughly 40 to 44 percent increase globally. Of that growth, more than 70 percent is expected to come from Asia, overwhelmingly China and India. I'm going to throw out a thesis. There's a lot of scholarship behind it. I'm going to ask you to trust me, but there, there, it is a proven uh, scholarly uh, um, uh, thesis, and that is development is good that it is in the planet's interest that as many people as possible have access to clean water, to reliable electricity, to market their goods, to get roads to market, to, to get their goods to the marketplace, opportunities for health and education and the chance to raise their young with uh, 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 reasonable expectations of stability and, and, uh, and prosperity. The contrary, that it is not in the planet's interest to have increased poverty, disease, to have no access to clean water, health, education, 
opportunity to produce or get your goods to market. Now, there is, in addition to that thesis, another scholarly proven thesis, which is the more there is growth, remember growth is good, development, we want it for as many people as we can get. The more growth there is, the more fuel it takes to provide that growth. That energy is needed to fuel development. And that's almost a linear relationship. Um, so the, the question then immediately emerges, is there enough of it? Does the planet have enough resource to meet this demand, this demand growth, and the expectations uh, that, that come with it? That invites the topic of the peak oil debate. Peak oil uh, is that point at which the planet has consumed roughly half of its energy resources. After that, you don't run out of energy. It just costs more, takes longer, is harder to get at as you go down that slope. But peak, have we used half of the energy resources of the planet? The, the short answer is people don't know how much the planet has. So if you don't know the totality, then computing half of it is problematic. How cheap oil can be, how much of it we consume, how we consume it, whether we switch, whether we move, these depend on many factors, many of which have nothing to do with the geology. It's not about whether there's oil in the ground. I'm a middle-class kid from a middle-class family. We had, and all my little friends had, the same things in their family. We had one car. We had one TV. You're shaking your heads already. <laughs> we had one telephone. The whole house. My mother wasn't deprived. She wasn't denied. It simply never occurred to her to redo the kitchen. You know my mom. <laughs> the way we consume, how we consume, what we consume, what makes it possible to consume, all of that changes. And that means what you use changes. The rate at which you use it changes. It doesn't talk about what's in the ground. A big issue is officially the, the planet has run out of oil five times. One of, the, one of the reasons for this is technology. 30 years ago, the definition of full production of oil was 40% of all the oil of a known oil field was able to be extracted and put in the marketplace. 40%. That was the definition of full production. Today, the technology is such that the definition is 70%. Does it mean we made more oil? No. But we can get at it. We can make it available at a, at a, a marketing uh, feasible uh, rate. There's more. It's not more in the ground, but more that we can access. Nature's whimsies. We don't know when the next act of terror is going to take place. But we know every year we're going to have hurricanes. We're going to have so many hurricanes, we have a season for them begins June 1. We know we're going to have so many hurricanes, we give them names. We know we're going to have so many hurricanes, we give them names in alphabetical order. That disrupts the flow of oil, of resources, of getting the sources to market. These are nature's whimsies. It doesn't mean that it changed the geological formations, but it affects what is available in the marketplace. So Katrina. Rita, tsunamis, earthquakes, pandemics. We were all worried about uh, avian flu. We should have been worried about Mexican pigs. Affecting the flow of the marketplace and uh, the consumption of, of energy. Uh, in addition to na uh, nature's whimsy, man's whimsy, piracy, kidnapping. 
We have Nigeria today unable to put more than a million barrels of oil a day on the marketplace because oil workers are being taken hostage. Doesn't affect whether or not it was available in the ground. We can't get it to the marketplace. Political decisions. Venezuela decides it's going to nationalize. It's going to take over the exploration and exploitation of its oil fields in order to subsidize meat. For that, they throw out ConocoPhillips, they throw out uh, Chevron and, um, and uh, ExxonMobil. Changes what is available for the marketplace, doesn't affect the, the geology. Russia takes a decision, a political decision, not to exploit its prodigious, its abundant, natural resources of both conventional oil and gas. You know, we talk in the United States about Arab oil. Uh, I should mention oil doesn't have a, a nationality and it doesn't have a religion, certainly. Um, but in Europe, they worry about Russian resources. They have watched Russia turn off the lights in Ukraine without ever firing a shot. And what's the first thing that, that, uh, that Germany does? It sends its prime minister to Russia. That was a political decision not to exploit its natural resources. Bangladesh has decided that its natural resource of, of natural gas is so precious, they've decided to leave it in the ground. Doesn't change whether or not it's available geologically. These are political decisions that affect whether or not product gets to market. What do we know if we don't know how much there is in the planet? What do we know? And of the what we know, where is it? Well, it so happens that we do know that there is roughly a trillion barrels of proven known reserves in the planet. Two-thirds of that happen to be in the Middle East. Overwhelmingly, the Arab oil producing region, which controls as a, as a, uh, a, a total uh, uh, group, 40% of the world's natural resources. This means they just swing vote. They don't control it. It's not a cartel. They would like it to be a cartel. Uh, and some would like them to, to, to be uh, a cartel so we could either blame them or, or woo them or something. But, but they are the swing producer. And that, and that is significant. Um, energy security, common concept. I can't imagine you've gone 24 hours without hearing the term energy, uh, energy security. It means different things to different people. If you are a consumer, then energy security means reliable access to available energy at known or acceptable cost. It's a range. The United States has been very effective at, at uh, making that available through conventional oil. Um, if, however, you are a producer, then energy security is about having reliable markets for your product with a known or knowable revenue stream. The last thing you want, the last thing you want is to be stuck with a whole lot of black goop that nobody wants. And overwhelmingly, the region we're talking about, the Arab uh, oil producing world, we're talking about essentially a one industry economy for all of these folks. These folks also were around. They remember, as do most of the chief uh, uh, executive officers of the international oil companies, what it was like when the price of oil plummeted to uh, less than $10 a barrel in the 80s and 90s. And they were stuck with a glut of something nobody wanted. If you are sitting in Saudi Arabia, and you are trying to plan, as a producer, how you're going to invest in your natural resource, 
These are protracted investments. These are multi-billion dollar investments. They are multi-decade uh, uh, long before anybody sees a, a, um, a return on their money. And your very best customer, the only game in town for most of the last uh, 100 years, says, I don't want your product. I don't want to be addicted to oil. I don't want to be dependent on oil. I'm getting off this. I'm not going to be your market. Make it, don't make it, I'm not buying it. Then you as a producer would be a fool not to look for other markets. And up until the year 2004, there weren't really any other markets. What happened in 2004? China took off. India took off. And we saw tremendous growth. Remember, development good. But it takes energy to fuel that growth. And suddenly, instead of the world's consumption growing at one, one and a half million barrels a day, which more or less could be accommodated by these resources, by the, by the known and, and uh, available resources, we were suddenly looking at uh, um, a sudden uptick in consumption. Three million barrels a day, four million barrels a day, and all of a sudden, the world focuses on the swing producer. How much can they ramp up? How fast can they ramp up? They didn't plan for this. They didn't invest for this. Where's the money going to come from? The price creeps up until it gets to a point where it's intolerable. And then you will have a crash. Nobody wants that. Neither consumer nor producer. It is not in anybody's interest to have that kind of volatility in the marketplace. So, what's the answer? For both consumer and producer, the solution is in diversification. For consumers, it is to, to augment the universe of available fuels so that we're not all crunching down on one commodity or two commodities or three commodities. And for the producer, it's diversification. Two kinds. One, to diversify markets, and it so happens that diversification is coming out of China and India, as well as to diversify commodities. Why? To make their one industry last longer. If the cash cow dies on you on Thursday, you've got to make all your plans and all your profit right away. Oh, dear. Okay. Um, and it so happens that there is a global shift in the marketplace. It so happens that when you look at, say, India, if they do nothing, their GDP will grow by 7%. If it rains, 8%. And if there's a miracle and they actually tackle any of their labor or land reform issues, double-digit growth. And what do they want? with this newfound money? What do they want as their middle class, remember, development good, their middle class grows. Their middle class already is larger than America has people. They want cars. They want cars that are, guess what, gonna run on gasoline. They're going to need roads, they're going to need lights, they're going to need fast food places, they're going to need motels, hotels, they've got places to go, people to see. Uh, Ratan Tata, the uh, uh, Indian industrialist, has invented the, the car that's under $2,000 called the Nano. Going to run on gas. China has decided and has promised its people that it's going to double the number of cars on the road by the year 2015. Double the number of cars on the road by the year 20. They have 25 million cars on the road. But China is 1.3 billion people. They have 25 million cars. The United States is under 320 million people, and we have 240 million vehicles. By the way, if you assume some people are too young to drive, 
some people are too old to drive, then some of us have more than one car. Middle class family. Now, what this means is the producers of this commodity, this range of commodities, see the marketplace shifting. And that's accurate. The marketplace is shifting from west to east. The market in the west has already saturated. If you look at Europe's consumption patterns today, they are already either stable, that is they're not, they're not growing or, or, or dipping, or they're dipping. In the, in the United States, we have a, a huge fleet. If we were to try now to adapt all of that to something new in the way of fuels or, uh, or have all electric vehicles, I mean, these are technologies that exist. The projections are that it's going to take 27 years to switch over a, a fleet. If, on the other hand, you're a new marketplace, you can just embrace all new products, all new technologies, all new fuels. If you're the United States or you're Western Europe, you have to displace something. And that is a, a, um, a socially wrenching thing. People have investments. People have, I'm running out of time. She's being very conscious. I asked her to do it. Um, so if you are in the oil producing Arab world, which carries the swing, swing production, you are acutely aware of one thing and one thing very, very uh, prominently. And that is that however long the planet has, because remember, we don't know what the totality is, however long the planet remains based on conventional oil, that's the clock that these one industry economies have to beat. So the longer they can stretch that out, the better. Um, this means we are looking at increasing and increasing cooperation. It calls for cooperation for working together on alternative technologies, alternative fuels, grow the universe of available fuel, reduce the focus so that we're not uh, a one commodity uh, marketplace as, as a planet, promote energy efficiency, Make the oil last longer so that it gives time to develop more uh, alternatives and uh, um, additional fuels. Develop those technologies. Do so in cooperation with the fellow consuming nations. And invest in innovation and smart people. Now, that three-part thing, uh, energy efficiency, uh, uh, augmenting fuels, um, and uh, investing in innovation and smart people. That normally takes me an hour, so I'm, I'm just going to say those three pieces and move on. The planet is best served by greater cooperation. This means that we need, we as a country, we as a community of consumers need to look at building these relationships. The top five oil producers in the world are Saudi Arabia, Russia, the United States, Iran, and China. How we develop these relationships together, I'm done, uh, <laughs> is, is key. Yo. <laughs> well, thank you, Molly. Thank you. And Dr. Paul, very much. Well, OK, I know there are a lot of questions. <laughs> so uh, it remains for me to say a few summary remarks. But I'm reminded of an old joke that I remember when I was in the Soviet Union, uh, that they used to tell about the Poles. And remember, this, the Russians saw the Poles in a much different way than our old Polish jokes. And the joke, essentially, very quickly, was that Władysław Gamulka, Polish leader at the time, Leonid Brezhnev and Konrad Adenauer were sitting around, and God comes down and says to them, I will grant you each your wish. And so Adenauer, as you might imagine, um, thinks about the Russians thinks of history, and asks God basically to destroy the Russian nation. He asks Brezhnev. Brezhnev says, you know, we've been invaded by Germany all this time, so I have a similar wish to that. So would you destroy the, the German nation? And then they, God asks Gamulka, so what do you want? He said, you know what? And he takes a drag on his cigarette. He says, I'll just have a cup of coffee if you grant those two wishes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to punt. 
Um, the only thing I would say about this is what, what uh, we have heard uh, basically indicates uh, that, one, U.S. interests are very closely linked to what's going on in the Middle East, and particularly now in I Iraq, in which uh, our eyes have been shifted somewhat given recent events. Two, the U.S. role is key to stability in the Middle East, uh, like it or not. Uh, we used to say in government that the U.S. is trusted by governments but not by people. I don't know whether our panelists uh, believe that or not. Um, some of the polls seem to indicate that. But now the governments are changing, so we may have to uh, uh, change our calculation. So the final thing I would say about this, based on what we have heard, is this. This um, uh, could, uh, connotes that American policy has great responsibility. We need to be very careful uh, what we say and how we say it. We need to be very careful whom we support, and especially what we say about whom we support, <laughs> because we can have a backlash based on, if you think of the polls, on what people uh, think about the United States and what role the United States is taking in the developments that are happening to them. That is their government policy toward the people of these countries that are now seem to be uh, seem to be in flux. So it seems to me that there are a lot of challenges involved here. Um, what Dr. Call said is um, about the State Department, by the way, in terms of passing the baton on what I guess Condi Rice called transformational diplomacy, but basically uh, for, uh, and what others called um, uh, nation building. Um, I would say good luck on that one because I noticed that the Congress is not particularly uh, positive toward funding uh, some of these uh, some of these things for the State Department. Um, I th it's a uh, it's a goal, and for, for, for me, the challenge is to maintain uh, the traditional tools that we have in our diplomatic bag and add the kind of tools that Dr. Um, uh, Cole mentioned for Cole mentioned for the. Um, uh, for the new generation of diplomats that are coming up. So I'll stop with that and let open that up. Uh, thank you again, uh, Stephanie, for, uh, for moderating this and to the sponsors uh, for putting this on. And thank you, too, for coming. Okay. Well, at this point, we are going to open it up for questions. Um, we have microphones set up on either side of the auditorium. So if I could ask you to go to the microphone to ask your question so that we can capture it for the recording. Um, but as long as I have a microphone, I'm going to use the moderator's uh, prerogative for first question um, and give you all a chance to formulate your own. Um, something that we discussed today, we had a little luncheon with um, Molly, and um, we were talking about the criticism the administration has been getting for not speaking soon enough, not speaking strongly enough in support of the demonstrators. And these are things that we also heard um, at the time of the um, Green Movement in Iran. Um, but some commentators suggest that the U.S. showing support um, might actually doom the movements from the start. So how does the administration, since we're talking policy here, how does the administration balance those critiques and formulate something that's going to advance our interests and while not harming the movements that are, are on the ground already? And I open this to the whole panel. You know, it's a, it's a major, it was a major challenge. It was a major challenge in 2000, in the summer of 2009 after uh, Iran's uh, uh, election fiasco. Uh, it was obviously a challenge in the context of, of uh, the events in Cairo. <clears throat> there are similarities and differences. The similarities are we don't want to be the story uh, that countries in this part of the world are very sensitive about foreign interference. <clears throat> That, that sometimes leaning too far forward into this can make it about us and can make the folks who are actually protesting, demonstrating more vulnerable uh, to uh, uh, backlash by the regimes, certainly in the case of Iran. Iran has a long history uh, dating back to the immediate aftermath of the revolution as well as their behavior during the Iran-Iraq war of, of using the argument of foreign conspiracies as a justification uh, to instigate heinous uh, uh, repression against, uh, against uh, opposition movements. So in both Iran and Egypt, what we decided to do as an administration was to lean forward in terms of, of defending our principles. That is to say that instead of taking sides, to say that everybody has a universal right to freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, free access to information, uh, and uh, freedom to not uh, be bludgeoned to death 
uh, when they're out protesting. Right? This played out in different, in different ways, however, in Egypt versus Iran, in part because in Egypt we had a, a relationship with the government and we had a very close relationship with the Egyptian military, which meant that our public messaging could be complemented by private messaging about the importance of restraint and in, uh, and in meeting the aspirations of the people and in getting out ahead of this as opposed to uh, just approaching it in an old school way. Needless to say, we don't have the same type of relationship with the Iranian government. Uh, and uh, that uh, made, it, made it more complicated. So we, we try to stand on principles in both cases while not, may while not pushing us into the forefront. Because at the end of the day, what's going on in Tehran or what's going on in Cairo isn't about us. It's about them. Uh, and we, sh we're, we stand ready to help where we can, uh, but, but we need to be cautious about how we do it so that we don't inadvertently give uh, regimes excuses to, uh, to uh, crack down on, on, on these types of protesters. Ditto. <laughs> I would add that um, the, the challenge, the tension for uh, any commentator, whether a government, whether the media, uh, whether NGOs, uh, is that we do have very strong interests in the kind of relationships that have been established most noticeably, no, most notably, uh, the Israel-Egyptian peace and the uh, leadership uh, that we hoped that would build for a Jordanian uh, is Israeli peace, and in fact, it, it was promoted. Uh, the uh, Egyptian support uh, for uh, our operations in Iraq, for being uh, um, a, a player uh, on some of our international uh, initi initiatives uh, with respect to counter-terror, counter-narcotics, and, uh, and the like. The problem of having a, what is a quintessentially uh, internal um, uh, chaos uh, of a leader who was an autocrat for uh, more than 30 years and a young population, half the population of, of Egypt is under the age of 24 with an educated middle class and no options, no opportunities uh, to grow, to uh, gain employment, to have dignity. Uh, those are tough tensions, and nobody uh, wants to make comment lightly. Uh, it would not serve either for the relationships in the region. We send signals by what we say and what we don't say uh, to the region, to our, uh, our allies, to our enemies, uh, as well as to our own <coughs> domestic concerned uh, audiences who are very quick, maybe perhaps even quicker, uh, to criticize uh, uh, the administration over what it says or doesn't say. All of those are audiences that have uh, their own interests as well, uh, and that all of that gets, gets played out. It needs to be addressed very delicately. I the only thing I, the only thing I would point out here is how difficult the balancing act is on on in a, in a, in a time like this. Now I I think uh, President Obama did a pretty good job at this. I was beginning to get a little bit worried uh, about um, being preachy and being identified by one side or the other as sort of the the uh, Deus ex machina on this thing of calling the shots. But I think so far we've done a pretty good. Act, but balancing it between, as, as you point out, domestic considerations and the push for quite uh, responsible human rights groups, for example, and our national interest, as described in, in terms of oil in the region, is a um, is not an easy thing to do. Uh, so far, uh, and nobody is going to be able to predict how this whole situation, what the infection rate is going to be, uh, how the regimes are going to respond. So we're in a really Difficult period of time right now. I think so. That's I think that's well to keep in mind. I feel you.
Dr. Call, if you allow me to repeat this so yep. the room can hear. Um, Professor Potter's question was about military to military relationships between the United States and Egypt and how that's going to play out, correct? Okay. Yeah, so let me say a few things about, you know, the Egyptian military is a little different from some of the, the, uh, the militaries in other parts of the developing world and in the region. Um, remember, I made, I made the point during the Iraq presentation about the importance of police primacy and having the, the army oriented outwards as opposed to oriented inwards. You know, Egypt has a very professional, outwardly oriented uh, army. Um, they are not historically, uh, or at least in recent times, a, a, a instrument of internal repression. Uh, and uh, they have a very good reputation, um, uh, in part stemming from uh, their conduct during the 1973 uh, war. And they're a conscript army, so they're very much an army of the people. Um, this position, I think, the Egypt and, and then the Egyptian military itself is also a very powerful economic actor in Egypt, in the tourism industry, manufacturing, and other things. So, the Egyptian military was interestingly positioned as as a buffer between the protesters and the regime. That is, they were they had a foot in both worlds in a sense, and they had a very uh, stark interest in making sure that whatever happened, there was a stable outcome. Um, then you have the nature of our relationship. You know, since the Camp David Accords, we've provided more than a billion dollars in military assistance every year, and with that goes a pretty uh, 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 intimate military-to-military -military, uh, relationship. And so as the military role in this became pivotal as, as being kind of the actor of restraint, you know, once the police disappeared from the streets and the army uh, went out and basically uh, uh, stood between different factions of the protesters, but also basically largely didn't uh, engage in, in violent repression of the, of the protesters, and then ultimately were critical in the transition of Mubarak's authority, first to Soleiman and then to what's called the SCAF, this, that's another acronym, right, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. Um, our ability to have communications with the Egyptian military uh, were really important. I, you know, I don't want to exaggerate our role in this, okay? These decisions were ultimately made by the Egyptians on all sides. We were really kind of meaningful on the margins. But we were amplifying what you were hearing in public and private about the importance of restraint. And specifically, the Secretary of Defense talked to, to Field Marshal Tantawi, who is the, the head of their armed services, their Minister of Defense, uh, on six occasions since the crisis uh, uh, broke out. And then um, Admiral Mullen, our, our Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, talked to his equivalent, uh, General Anon, Lieutenant General Anon, on almost as many occasions. And then we had contacts at much lower levels, uh, up and down our two bureaucracies, kind of echoing these messages of, you know, thank you for the professionalism that you've shown, thank you for the restraint that you've shown, you know, we stay committed, we, we stand committed to this uh, relationship, we're obviously watching events closely, uh, uh, and uh, we want to, you know, basically giving them credit for the restrained uh, be behavior. Um, so I, how decisive it was, I don't know, the historians will have to sort that out, uh, but it was a pretty big part of our job uh, over the last uh, three weeks. Yeah, my question is for Dr. Colley. Um, I'm interested in um, how the administration is approaching Syria um, when it comes to the, the Iraqi uh, restructuring. Um, there was a lot of talk, you know, back during the more violent days about you know, fighters and, and weapons coming across the border. And uh, there was one point where um, I believe the, the military had attacked some uh, fighters on Syrian soil, or perhaps what I read, I, I was in Damascus at the time. And I just like to, I just like to know what your what the administration is thinking about, how they're approaching this issue. No, it's a great question. You know, um, I was uh, I took two trips to Damascus in my current capacity uh, in in uh, 2009, which was the were the first kind of official. Uh, certainly, as it relates to defense or military engagements, uh, since I think 2004 or 2005. And the goal was actually to try to organize um, a trilateral Syrian-Iraqi-U.S. border assessment program, and in part as a way to get at some of these challenges with foreign fighters. Um, it used to be that at the height of the violence, at the height of the Sunni insurgency, in excess of 100 foreign fighters were coming across the border every month. A large percentage of the suicide bombers were coming through uh, Syria. Those numbers have since declined. Uh, it varies, but think, think in the range of 10 a month although they continue to be you know, a large number of the suicide uh, uh, bombers. So we've, you know, there's been some progress, but not enough. Right? 
And so we thought that there might be a way to, to, uh, to have a trilateral mechanism which got at that challenge while also building some confidence between the Syrians and the, and the Iraqis and frankly building some confidence between the Syrians and us. Uh, and it was part of uh, President Obama's uh, uh, you know, concept to be more forward-leaning and engaging the Syrians, sending an ambassador back and things like that. Problem was, a, a couple days before the first border assessment was supposed to happen, uh, a series of bombs went off in Baghdad. This was in August, on August 19th of, of 2009. Prime Minister Maliki blamed the Syrians for it, and it scuttled the whole thing. And we really haven't uh, been able to resume the process since. So that's the, that's the bad news. The good news is, I think the Syrians ultimately have an interest in two things. They have an interest in Iraq being a stable neighbor, and ultimately they have an interest in the, in the same foreign fighter networks that are passing through Syria, not setting up shop in Syria and targeting the Syrian regime. So my hope is that those two interests will continue to, to incentivize the Syrians over the coming years to basically stop playing this double game of saying that they're in favor of, of security in, in Iraq while you still have this flow of foreign fighters coming across. So we'll, we'll have to see. Um, I mean, we have concerns about Syrian behavior in a lot of parts of that. You know, their, their support for Hezbollah, uh, their support for Hamas. Um, so there are a whole range of challenges that we continue to face with the Syrians. There's one back. Can you? I was uh, wondering, this question's uh, kind of geared toward um, what uh, Molly Williamson was talking about. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of elaborate more on um, how you described how the, the new um, Indian and uh, Chinese um, governments have kind of taken off, like the economies have taken off. And I was wondering if um, you could kind of um, elaborate more on um, how that's going to affect their investment in the Middle East and how that's going to affect our investment in the Middle East and what kind of interplay is going to happen between our markets and the Eastern markets. Um, yes, good, good for you uh, to, to ask that because um, one of the things that has happened over the last 30 years is that the major uh, consuming uh, uh, economies have tried to work together uh, to, conf to deal with the potential of disruptions in supplies. Uh, the, the Indians and the Chinese have not been part of that uh, dialogue over the years, uh, and now it, sh it, is, it becomes ever more important. Uh, the, the, the amount, I, I had mentioned that we uh, import more than 10 million barrels a day uh, overwhelmingly, that comes from the Western Hemisphere, Canada, Mexico, Venezuela. Only 17% of <coughs> everything we import comes from the Middle East, and that overwhelmingly uh, Saudi Arabia. What the um, oil-producing countries of the Middle East region uh, have experienced is tremendous interest from the marketplace to the East. And so there are investments, there are joint ventures uh, for, for uh, transport, that is building pipelines, um, terminals to receive product, refineries to refine product, uh, and then pipelines within uh, both China and India to get uh, product to market. Um, and in, in some cases, uh, we know that the, uh, the marketplaces in the East are willing to pay a premium. They are growing so fast, they are so eager. Uh, and at the same time, the saturated markets in the West, uh, that is those which are not growing at, at nearly the same rate, are focusing on continued energy efficiency. And the, the, uh, the game changer that I had alluded to in the, in the beginning, unconventional gas and unconventional oil uh, uh, available through shale, uh, especially in the United States, which is, it, it makes us uh, an, an energy exporter again, should we actually uh, go down that path. There are a number of concerns uh, on the environmental side, primarily on, with respect to wastewater, 
uh, and um, I understand that private industry is, is uh, working very hard now to see how they can reclaim that, GE in, in particular. But what it means is that the investment strategies in the eastern marketplaces are going for everything they can possibly get. I mean, they, they need to grow, and they need to grow fast because they're aging. And our focus on innovation, on alternatives, on um, uh, renewables. Um, but the problem is for us, we don't have a lot of money. There is a deficit spending uh, in, in, in place. And so if you look at those countries that have the money for these investments and those countries that need to innovate uh, but don't have the money, then you, you get a, a picture of where some of these stresses and, and, and strains are going to come from. This is a question for both speakers, but I sort of draws into the point made by uh, Molly Williamson about the shift to alternatives, energy, energy diversification in the Middle East. It seems as though many uh, regimes, particularly on the Arabian Peninsula, have cited as their major alternative nuclear power. Um, and I'm wondering, given uh, the U.S. concerns about proliferation in the region and the history of uh, dual use uh, reactors in India and Pakistan, whether the uh, concerns that we have with energy security um, potentially come in conflict with uh, concerns we have about proliferation security. Good for you. Good for you. What's your name? Uh, Edmund Zagarin. Edmund? Yeah. Uh, great, great question. Thank you for that. Um, uh, yes, you, you uh, identify um, actually several uh, dilemmas of uh, energy policy, uh, nuclear policy, non-proliferation concerns, uh, and, and the like. Um, if, if you start with the three-legged stool, the rickety three-legged stool of the non-proliferation uh, treaty, the NPT, uh, and see that there, uh, there is a, a a three-part deal. One, those countries that have nuclear weapons promise to disarm. Two, well, it's not one, two, three, but there, there are three legs to this. Uh, another one is that those countries which have not yet developed promise not to develop, promise not to acquire nuclear weapons. And the third leg of this three very rickety stool uh, is a three-legged stool, is a recognition that all countries, if they play by the rules, are entitled to the benefits of peaceful nuclear energy. So what you get out of that is a, um, is a, a disconnect. Those countries which generally uh, speaking uh, uh, have the weapons, are, they're known as nuclear weapon states. They're the club. It's a small club. It's bigger than we would like, but nonetheless, it's small. And those who don't argue, aha, this is about the, the big guys who have the weapons just don't want us to have them. And so there has to be a greater effort to demonstrate that there is, among those uh, states with nuclear weapons, a determination to reduce and ultimately uh, get to uh, uh, zero, although some, some people would say that would be a foolish notion. Um, and, and that's why it was so important for uh, the START Treaty that Professor uh, Levitsky was so instrumental uh, in negotiating the, the uh, uh, value of seeing it renewed with the Russians that the, that the Obama administration uh, worked so hard uh, to do in order to demonstrate that, yes, the tenets of the NPT are still valid. What that has meant then is what to do about this third leg. So Iran can say, what? All we want to do is have the peaceful, the benefits of peaceful nuclear energy. 
And we are members of the NPT. We are signatories. We have never tested. We don't have a weapon, and we're not going to develop a weapon. We are entitled, right? Unlike, let us say, the three countries which have not joined the regime, the, the, the NPT rules of the game, or North Korea, which did join and reneged and walked away and, and showed that it, it acted in bad faith. What you have alluded to in, um, in the Gulf states, and in particular the um, emphasis on the UAE and the landmark uh, decision that they made to become the first carbon neutral uh, state, and they came up with something called the Mazdar. Uh, it's part of the Mubadala Initiative, a, a very prominent, very uh, exciting notion, fully funded already. Um, this will allow them to have the benefit of peaceful nuclear uh, energy. And for this, they have been willing, and they uh, signed up to this in very, uh, very um, intricate negotiations. It wasn't a gift. It wasn't a freebie. It wasn't a trust me uh, kind of deal that said, we are willing to submit to extraordinary, intrusive, constant monitoring to prove that we aren't playing uh, uh, um, a bad faith game uh, in order to have these benefits. And oh, by the way, this allows us to keep our conventional resources in the marketplace drawing in revenue for us. Um, and so um, the, the thesis was, if we do it right, then the whole region has a model for how to do it right. And if Iran really wants to uh, demonstrate that all it's after is peaceful nuclear energy, then it should be prepared to submit to this model, this, this example that the UAE uh, has provided. Iran, on the other hand, has, re has uh, countered that, hang on, we've been, we've been good faith players, never mind for the moment that nobody seems to be agreeing with them, uh, but how is it that the big club says, oh, no, um, this is way too dangerous. We we should we don't want to see we don't want to see uh, any any nuclear weapons being added to uh, to the planet. It's too dangerous for the for the planet. If that's the case, says Iran, then those who have the nuclear weapons disarm already. If, says Iran, that's not the argument. And the fear is, oh my gosh, we're we're, we're worried about the introduction of volatile, fearful. Uh, nuclear technologies, then, oh, by the way, what about Israel? And, oh, by the way, what about India, which has never signed on to the NPT, has developed weapons, has tested, and they're the fair-haired boys who got a special nuclear uh, uh, commercial deal with uh, the West. It must be, says Iran, because the club has something against us, and that resonates, unfortunately. And so it's all the more important that we demonstrate, the, the planet demonstrate, continuing commitment on disarmament and continuing commitment on peaceful nuclear benefits while maintaining the rules of the game. There are also some people who say throughout the rules of the game. That's a whole different discussion. <clears throat> Look, I I think the proliferation concerns that we have in the region are, are, are real. I mean, they, 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 I think they stem a little less from the civilian nuclear program per se in these places and more from what the cascading effect of, of Iran's pursuit of a nuclear weapons capability could be. Um, I think that were Iran to actually achieve a nuclear weapons capability, I, in general, I'm not a doomsayer as it relates to, to, to kind of proliferation cascades. I, th I think they often don't happen. But I think in this part of the world, uh, there would be a lot of pressure on countries like Turkey and Egypt and Saudi Arabia to to follow suit uh, in the in the case of Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon. So um, they say so. They say so. So we have to watch it closely. Um, the at the heart of the NPT bargain is is precisely what uh, Molly pointed out. And I, I think in this context, what we call the one two three agreement with the United Arab Emirates, which Molly mm -hmm. alluded to, is particularly important because. It, it, you know, one of Iran's arguments is you don't respect our peaceful right to pursue uh, civilian nuclear power. And the argument is, sure we do. 
We just think you need to do it under safeguards that address the concerns of the international community. And oh, by the way, here's an agreement that we have with United Arab Emirates, which puts restrictions on domestic enrichment, which has very tough safeguards, uh, verification procedures, et cetera. And in exchange, they get a lot of uh, uh, nuclear cooperation with the United States. Mm -hmm. That's the model, right? It, it shows that we're not against uh, is, uh, you know, Muslim countries developing uh, civilian nuclear power. It shows that we're not against countries in that part of the world uh, doing so, as long as they do so uh, under appropriate safeguards that assuage the concerns of the international community. And oh, by the way, it's not just us who has concerns about Iran's nuclear program. Uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1929 was backed by the Russians and the Chinese, not just us and the Europeans. So there are real concerns uh, that people have uh, about this program and a real collective international interest uh, in, in seeing Iran live up to its obligations. The only other point I'd make, I'm not an energy expert like, like, like Molly is, but um, don't discount the role that solar energy can play in the future of this part of the world, particularly in Saudi Arabia, where you have you know, more than 300 days of, of sunlight and enormous tracts of desert. And if they were able, ever able to convert a large amount of, of solar energy potential into something, into a portable energy source like hydrogen fuel cells or something, you know, 100 years from now, Saudi Arabia could be, could be the hydrogen uh, leader in the way that it's the oil leader uh, now. And I will tell you, it's from, you know, I'm not, again, not, a, not in the energy sector, but just in, just in kind of on the side conversations I've had with Saudi officials, they make reference to the fact that, that solar energy could very much be in their country's future. So we'll see. So good. I've gone to, um, you know, I've done 59 country stops in 22 hmm. months in the job. Nine of those have been to Israel. So other than Iraq, where I've been 13 times, Israel is the second most, and, and engaged in all sorts of security dialogue uh, with them on a whole host of, of issues. Um, they have a lot of anxieties about the, the various challenges they face in the region, the challenge of Iran's nuclear program, the fact that Hezbollah has 45 to 50,000 rockets and missiles that can now, many of which can now reach central Israel, uh, you know, the concerns they have about Hamas and Gaza. But the two things that they've kind of taken for granted have been the stability of the peace with Egypt and the stability of the peace in Jordan. And so this is very unnerving to them. Um, I think they're in a wait and see mode, uh, but they're nervous. And you know, one reaction to being nervous might be to be more risk averse and, and you know, to move down the path of peace is to assume some risk, right? So one could argue that, that maybe that'll slow things down. But there are voices in, in Israel that argue the opposite case as well, that argue that that a democratically uh, uh, elected and legitimate Egyptian government that also abides by the peace agreement with Israel could actually make the peace between Israel and, and Egypt much more enduring because it wasn't rooted just in Mubarak. Um, there's also an argument that if you believe that the that popular movements are going to pick up some steam in some other places, not maybe in the revolutionary way that they did in Egypt, but nevertheless in that way, there might be an argument for um, you know, moving aggressively forward and reaching an agreement with the Palestinians so that some, some of the anti-Israeli sentiment that you see on the street in the region would be dissipated. And there's an argument that, the, that some of the Israelis have made on that. So I think the answer is I don't know. And I think that the, the Israelis are having this internal debate yeah. themselves about, about what, it, what this all means for the peace process. Yeah, and I think, the, uh, just going back into my pedagogical role a little bit, there are really some interesting things coming out now with, and, and being made public, you know, the, the uh, both WikiLeaks and uh, Al Jazeera published some some documents. The uh, the Washington or the uh, New York Times um, Sunday Magazine had it, some interesting articles with some maps on it about the peace process, what the possibilities were. The Baker uh, Institute uh, that's headed by Ed Jerigian, who was ambassador to both Israel and uh, Syria. and Syria and Egypt, I think as well, yeah. wasn't he? He was in Egypt, okay has uh, published a book which shows maps and things. Uh, there's um, um, uh, the, uh, what is it, the Washington Institute uh, on um, <coughs> Near East Policy has got a study out as well. So there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. Uh, and I was, I was uh, bef bef and some of it came out before all this, uh, all these events happened. I thought, well, maybe something is happening. So I, I asked the question because, you know, I know given the difficult politics in Israel then, in Netanyahu's inclina own inclinations, there's a kind of tendency, well, we don't have to do this now. That's why I asked the question. I hope that isn't the case. But. I, the only thing I would say is, uh, you know, I, I don't know what Prime Minister Netanyahu is going to decide, and, and my department doesn't lead yeah, the peace right. process. You know, um, Senator Mitchell and, and, uh, and Secretary of State and, and, and the, the White House are very much in the, in the lead on all of that. I will say that one of the things that is 
a, a big change in the region from, say, 20 years ago is how much latent potential there is for cooperation across the Israeli-Arab divide if the Palestinian issue it's, uh, was resolved. Yeah, sure. Because they have so many common concerns about terrorism, proliferation, ballistic missiles, radicalization, energy, water. There are so, there's, such a, there's such collective action potential there that if you were able to clear away, and I don't mean to trivialize it, right. but I mean if you were able to, to not let the Palestinian issue be a stumbling block, I think over 10 or 20 years you could, you, could, you could see patterns of cooperation that you would have thought could never have happened. So I, this is one of the reasons why, you know, there was this back and forth with the Israeli government a bit in the first year of our administration about whether the priority should be the peace process or Iran. Mm -hmm. And our argument has also been that the answer is both. It, you have to pursue both simultaneously because the, the, you know, Iran's nuclear ambitions and their support for terrorism in the region are no kidding security challenges, but the peace process also enables and unlocks all sorts of uh, uh, avenues to, uh, to, you know, to isolate Iran, to take away their ability to use the resistance narrative to gain support uh, in, the, in the Arab street, and over the long term to forge some patterns of cooperation uh, that, that uh, you know, could radically realter politics in that, in that part of the world. So we continue to push on both. I don't know how successful we'll be. Okay. Yes, sir. Does it, does it seem to you as though the uh, Palestinian Authority has taken some inspiration from the events in Egypt in calling for elections now? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think that, you know, on the one hand, it's clear that Egypt is on everybody's mind. Uh, in the whole, it, Egypt is on everybody's mind, yeah. you know. Um, you have President Ali Abdullah Saleh in Yemen taking steps. You have King Abdullah in Jordan taking steps. You have uh, the Palestinian Authority taking steps. The, the government in Bahrain uh, is going to take some steps. I, so I don't know how much you, but, I, but in this particular case, I don't know how much to attribute this particular instance. But certainly what the events in Egypt are, are complicating not just for the Israelis, but for the Palestinians too, because Mubarak was, was, was among their bigger uh, supporters. They, they, they have to be uncertain about what their relationship is going to be with the next uh, uh, Egyptian government. Um, so I, I, I don't know the answer to that question other to say that kind of everybody in the region is nervous. But I think our, our point on this is, you know, people have talked about this tension between stability and, and democracy in, in, in general, but in this part of the world in particular. I think depending on how you view time, it's also, we also know that the absence of democracy is also a source of instability. So, it's, so I think I, and moving forward, I think it, it behooves the regimes in the region to kind of get out in front of this. And, and we're not going to tell them how to do it. They're going to have to figure out their, their own way. It's not us imposing a set of ideals, but it is, there are legitimate aspirations of their people uh, that these regimes will have to figure out a way to, to accommodate uh, in some ways. And they're going to all do it in their own, in their own uh, particular fashion. It would be nice to have good, stable, democratic governments that we could deal with. We've always made the, you know, we always make the, the point that, in fact, democracy brings stability because it's limited government that's, that has limitations on imposed by the people, can't engage in foreign adventures, this kind of thing. So, one the worst in, in Shala, yeah. let's say, in Shala, <laughs> that's right. It's well, thank you all to, for coming today, and thank you for